Hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Domina, and I am a professor and head of the English department at Northern Michigan University. And today I'm welcoming Melissa Homestead, author of the recently published The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis. We will continue this series monthly, at least during the academic year, on the third Friday each month at one o'clock Eastern time, with some time off uh, from May until August. Our presenter next month will be Katie Booth, and she'll be talking about her book, The Invention of Miracles, Language Power, and Alexander Graham Bell's Quest to End Deafness. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, the icons for the chat and for Q&A. Feel free to use the chat to talk with one another. If you would like to ask a question for Dr. Homestead, please put it in the Q&A. I'll be monitoring that for our question period, which will follow her talk. If you see a question that interests you, you can also give it a thumbs up icon and that will let me know it's a popular question. This episode will be recorded and then posted on YouTube. If you'd like to, the link to the recording when it is available, just email me at English at nmu.edu and I'll forward that to you. You can also just search Let's Talk Books at NMU on YouTube and you'll find it. Before we get started, I wanna give a big thanks to Matt Herbig from Audiovisual Services here at Northern Michigan University who was helping with the technical end of this series and to Dr. Rob Wynn, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences who is supporting us financially. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Melissa Homestead. Dr. Homestead is professor of English at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, where she also serves as program faculty in women and gender studies and as director of the Cather Project. She has written or edited several earlier volumes, including American Women Authors and, the Liter and Literary Property from 1822 to 1869. She has published numerous articles and is engaged in digital projects. And in addition to all of this, she is an all around wonderful person. So Dr. Homestead, welcome. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay. So you're gonna stop share? Yep. And here I go. Oops, wait a second, where did my... Hold on a second. My PowerPoint went down. Here we go. I'm gonna have to share screen again. Sorry for a second here. Share screen. Something is going wrong here. Why is my PowerPoint not coming up? Awkward. No, no, that's not it. One more time. We practiced beforehand, but of course now, this is very strange actually. Why is my PowerPoint not coming? It's not coming up as one of my screens. Hmm. Do we have our tech help here? Do, if you go back, um, if, you re, if you minimize, the zoom screen and then click up your PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but I'm gonna, it's just not, PowerPoint is not showing up as oh, okay. one of my screens. Let's close down other things and see if that helps. Okay, back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, share screen one more time. Oh, here we go. There we go. It always okay. works eventually. It always does. So now I need, oops, slideshow play from start. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. So I'm happy to be presenting to you about my book, the Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis, which was published April 1st last year. 
I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, but as it so happens, I'm on spring break and I'm presenting to you from a hotel room in New York City. So I hope that the wireless holds up. So far, it seems so good. So my presentation is going to be in two parts. Um, first, I'll give an overview of the book chapter by chapter, accompanied by images. And then I'll talk about some questions of method that relate to the focus of this webinar series of diversity. There are some who persist in thinking of the past as less diverse than today in terms of sexuality and who maintain that there is no evidence of Cather's lesbian sexuality. In terms of historical interpretation then, what properly counts as evidence of queerness in the past and why it's been so hard to see Edith Lewis for who she was and what she was in Cather's life. Those are the questions driving the second half of the presentation. But I'll begin with my overview. So there are two strands of argument throughout my book, signaled in my title by the phrase creative partnership. First, that is two ambitious career women, and here they are, the Jeffrey, New Hampshire in 1926. Cather and Lewis created a romantic and domestic partnership that allowed them to enjoy love and intimacy and to pursue their ambitions. Second, that as an editor, Lewis was a partner in Cather's creative process and also used her expertise in advertising to help craft Cather's image as an author. And this is a page from Cather's 1925 novel, The Professor's House, and all of the handwriting on it is Edith Lewis's. My book starts and ends at the old burying ground in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, where Cather and Lewis are buried side by side. I hope that by the end of the book, I've succeeded in undoing the mythology around the gravesite that has obscured Lewis's place in Cather's life. Having started at the end, and with my own first visit to Jaffrey in the autumn of 1984 when I was a college senior, I turn the clock back, introducing Edith Lewis as the young woman whom Willa Cather first met in Lincoln, Nebraska in August 1903 at the home of Sarah Harris, publisher of the Lincoln Courier. Now, neither Cather nor Sarah Harris nor Edith Lewis is in this picture, but this is the Harris house, which still stands in Lincoln. And this picture was taken in 1903. I think that's Sarah Harris's mother and brother. Delving briefly into Lewis's New England family history, I paint a picture of her family's life in Nebraska before she herself emerged um, into public view as an adolescent studying at the University of Nebraska. She's in the lower right-hand corner there with her sorority and publishing short stories in the Lincoln Courier. She transferred to Smith College in Massachusetts where she met Oxa Barlow. This is Oxa, who was her roommate, assigned her sophomore year, an important character in the book and from which she graduated in 1902 in this yearbook picture of her literary society. She's in the back row with a sailor collar. Chapter two follows Lewis to New York City where she moved um, after a year back in Lincoln teaching school. This is actually the corner of Washington Square where she moved in 1903. The building with the rounded lintel is 60 South Washington Square, which was a rooming house. And I trace the growth of her relationship with Cather, both personal and professional in this chapter from their first meeting in 1903, in 1903 through about 1918. From 1906, both Cather and Lewis worked at McClure's Magazine. And I argue that the magazine office was the crucible of their collaborative work on Cather's fiction. This is actually a poem that was published in McClure's magazine in 1911. Um, it's a Cather poem, The Swedish Mother, and the red pen edits on it are Edith Lewis's handwriting. She was an editor at McClure's at the time. And that's the first example I ever found of her editing Cather. I also argue that Cather and Lewis, in choosing to make a home together in 1908, and this is the Washington Place apartment building where they moved in 19. 1908, we're emulating Sarah Orne Jewett and Annie Fields. And here's Jewett and Fields, Jewett on the left and Fields on the right, who are identified by most scholars as the prototypical Boston marriage. In any event, Cather left McClure's, Lewis moved on to Every Week magazine, and I recover Lewis's work as an editor of fiction at Every Week, um, including as a context for understanding Cather's fiction. So on the right is something, if you've read My Antonia, um, in addition with the illustrations you might recognize, that's Vyas Benda's illustration of Lena Lingard knitting out in the field while she's tending cattle. On the left is a story that Edith Lewis commissioned for every week, a short, short story. And it's also illustrated by Benda. And you can see it's the same woman wearing the same clothes. So he was using the same model for both of these at the same time. And there's a kind of a conversation, I think, between Cather and Lewis about representing immigrants in the West. Uh, in, in fact, Scandinavian immigrants. This is a Scandinavian immigrant story, Mourning by Elizabeth Gaines Wilcoxon. In chapter three, 
I turn the clock back to 1915 to tell the story of Catherine Lewis's four shared trips to the US Southwest. Here they are at Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde in 1915. Throughout the book, Lewis's editing of Cather's fiction is a key theme, but I linger over the evidence here because the first for a surviving edited typed draft of one of Cather's novels is The Professor's House, uh, 1925, as I said before. Um, and I could just spend all day just showing you pages from The Professor's House. And sometimes I joke that at least half of my book is just about this typescript. But in any event, uh, the Southwestern travels in 19, uh, their 1915 and 1916 Southwestern travels were the basis for The Professor's House. And this is a map Edith Lewis drew in 1915. Um, this is a Northern New Mexico map. Uh, and then their Southwestern travels in 1925 and 26. Here they are riding horseback in 1925, inspired Death Comes for the Archbishop, which was published in 1927. Although there is no type draft of that particular novel, there is a rich record of their travel and literary collaboration. After mining the record of their experiences together in the desert Southwest, I focus in chapter four on Lewis's career as an advertising copywriter at the J. Walter Thompson Company arguing that her advertising copy for soap and hand lotion and Cather's fiction are in conversation with one another. Here they are literally on the same page. Uh, ad magazines would add strip stories. They'd start out occupying the whole page and then you would run the later portions of it with advertisements next to them. It was a two part story as you can see here. They could provide a synopsis of part one of Uncle Valentine. Um, and next to it is an advertisement for Jurgen's hand lotion for which Edith Lewis wrote the advertising copy. I also hypothesize that Lewis was behind the famous Edward Steichen portrait of Cather published in Vanity Fair in 1927. Lewis worked extensively with Steichen on advertising campaigns. That previous photograph showed a Steichen photograph attributed to Steichen for advertising photography, and here is another. And Cather's portrait says Steichen as well. So Edith Lewis is helping to shape both the advertising image and Cather's image as an author. Lewis started in advertising in 1919 and she and Cather first sermoned on Grand Banan Island in 1922. And here they are. This is actually the cover image photoshops them together, but they're handing the camera back and forth, which is what a lot of my images show. I devote a separate chapter to their many summers on Grand Banan before and after they built their own cottage. And this also you'll recognize from the cover. Um, Edith Lewis hand colored a photograph. She did watercolor on Grand Manan, and at the top, Willa Cather has written, This is our little home. Cather has been portrayed as living in isolation on the island, but she was living with Lewis, who was actually the legal owner of the land and the cottage. Furthermore, at Whale Cove, they were part of a community of women and only women. In this chapter, I focus on both the collaborative work of the stories collected in the volume Obscure Destinies published in 1932. This is one of them, uh, Two Friends. And the handwriting, except for the stuff that has to do with typesetting, again, is all Edith Lewis's. Um, and I also think about how they both responded to the deaths of their parents in the late 20s and early 30s. And these two things are closely related. I also see them as moving past grief in the 1930s by inviting sisters and nieces to visit them on the island. And this is Mary Virginia Ald, Willa Cather's niece who grew up in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and who was living and working in New York at that point. And she took her on vacation at Grand Manan Island. In my last full chapter, I take Cather and Lois back to New York City where they settled into a large apartment at 570 Park Avenue. This is the building here in 1932. In 1927, they had lost their Greenwich Village apartment to subway construction and camped out in an apartment hotel for five years before leasing another apartment. They made their lives together there in this apartment and built relationships with each other's families and with the Menuhin family. So Yehudi Menuhin, the best known, the violinist, his sisters, Hepsiba and Yalta, also musicians and their parents. Both Cather and Lewis also died in this apartment, 25 years apart. And this year actually is the 75th anniversary of Cather's death and the 25th anniversary of Lewis's death, or the 50th, sorry, the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death. Appropriately, Lewis's profound grief um, after Cather's death occupies a significant portion of the final full chapter of my book. The years after Cather's 1947 death corresponded to the Cold War panic over homosexuality called by one historian, the Lavender Scare. In my epilogue, I consider how this context enabled some to deny Cather's lesbian sexuality and to refuse to see Lewis for what she was and what she had been in Cather's life. Now to turn to the questions of evidence and historical interpretation. 
some have devoted considerable energy to refuting the idea that Cather was a lesbian, claiming that those who characterize her as a lesbian are being ahistorical and projecting their own desires onto the past. As a lesbian myself, I've long found this particular line of argument frustrating. And although I did not take up the question in my book, I want to spend some time here refuting these claims and calling out the larger problem of double standards concerning evidence of sexuality and the presence of queer people, including lesbians, in the past. So Catherine Lewis's relationship was tac tacitly accepted among their friends and family. And mid 20th century critics and biographers clearly knew she was a lesbian, but were careful not to say so publicly in print. And I have read a lot of correspondence between people in the 1950s and 60s, and they definitely knew. However, Cather was only officially outed in biography by two late 20th century biographies, Phyllis Robinson's Willa, trade biography of 1993, and Sharon O'Brien's scholarly biography, Willa Cather, The Emerging Voice, which came out in 1987. In the wake of O'Brien's biography and readings of Cather's fiction relying on it, some vigorously denied her identification of Cather as a lesbian. These denials often took the form of dismissals of such an identification as merely conjecture or speculation in the absence of evidence of sexual activities. Others went further, suggesting that the explanation for the identification of Cather as a lesbian lay with biographers and critics themselves. Joan Akicella first advanced this position in an article in The New Yorker, which she expanded in Willa Cather and the Politics of Criticism, published as a book in 2000. Akachella portrays the identification of Cather as a lesbian in biography and criticism from the 1980s forward as an act of aggression by feminist critics against an essentially conservative author's, author whose life and works displease them. Labeling Cather as a lesbian, she claims, was a stick of dynamite feminists needed to blow Cather's world open. <laughs> Akachella concedes that Cather was likely homosexual in her feet feelings and celibate in her actions. Nevertheless, in her analysis, even what seem to be Cather's open expressions of love for other women are evidence that she was homosexual, not homosexual, or not in her actions because she felt she had nothing to hide. There has, of course, been a sea change in attitudes towards homosexuality since the publication of O'Brien's biography in 1987, and even since the publication of Akachella's book in 2000 consider especially the rapid transformation of the law to allow for same-sex marriage. But also I would say that the idea that there's always progress forward and movement upward, we're of course now pushing, there's a lot of pushback ex exactly against that progress. So history doesn't always behave in the way people might think it does. Um, anyway, despite this change, however, in a New Yorker blog post, Akachella used the publication of the selected letters of Willa Cather in 2013 to rehash the argument of Willa Cather and the politics of criticism. In her will, Cather prohibited the quoting from or publication of her letters. And as a result, until that policy changed shortly before the publication of the selected letters, scholars had to resort to paraphrase of letters. Akachella thus added a new claim to her critique of O'Brien's supposed mishandling of evidence that O'Brien's cognitive bias in favor of identifying Cather as a lesbian caused her to misrepresent key language in her paraphrase of one letter. Akachella doesn't specify the support, supposed source of O'Brien's cognitive bias. And frankly, I don't understand what she means by this. It's a psychological term. It seems that she's referring to confirmation bias as one particular form of cognitive bias. Nevertheless, Sacachella leaves her readers to fill in the supposed blanks that O'Brien was projecting contemporary identity politics onto an inappropriate object in the past because O'Brien herself is a lesbian. She isn't, by the way, and in fact, she had ex written essays expressing a, a caution about being a straight woman writing lesbian biography. In Akachella's blog post responding to the publication of the selected letters, she turns, Cather's fi she turns to Cather's fiction as evidence of the author's lack of sexual experiences, the lack of any romantic or sexual glow in Cather's portrayals of heterosexual love and romance in her fiction, and the absence of any sex going on in her portrayals of same gender bonds are evidence, Akachella claims, that Cather may have died a virgin. So Akachella doesn't pause to puzzle out what the concept of virginity might mean have meant for a woman whose sexual experiences were all with other women. 
Furthermore, she and others who continue to deny Cather's lesbian ne lesbianism never articulate what would count as evidence, although they seem to conflate sexuality with sexual activities. It would seem that they require no such proof of heterosexuality. When reconstructing the life of either partner in a heterosexual marriage, do scholars need to provide such evidence in order to prove heterosexual identity? Absent genetic testing, can we even be sure that children are evidence of sexual intercourse between a husband and wife? Or must we always remain open to the possibility that the wife was carrying on an affair with a male man while the husband was carrying on an affair with a man next door? And is marriage in any event defined purely by sexual activities in the most limited sense, or is marriage defined by sexuality in a broader sense, by love, affection, and intimacy? Evidence of Cather's heterosexuality has occasionally been proffered, but the evidence only points vaguely towards Cather's heightened emotional engagements with men that she knew for a short period of time. So even granting that I as a lesbian have cognitive bias in favor ident of identifying Cather as a lesbian, do straight people also suffer from a cognitive bias in favor of a straight Cather? Why do some feel the need to claim Cather as heterosexual or characterize her as homosexual in her feelings, but celibate in her actions? Queer critics who assume that Cather was a lesbian rightly treat lesbian as a historically specific category. And heterosexuality, of course, is also a historically specific category. Those who continue to deny the accuracy of lesbian label for Cather or her relationship with any woman do so as well. However, they diverge from the queer critics in treating the identification as an accusation that requires evidence to substantiate it while they treat heterosexuality as a universal truth that transcends history. In both her blog post, in her, both her book and her blog post, Akachella assumes that the entire biographical case for Cather's lesbianism rests on a single letter from Cather to Louise Pound, I'm gonna to refer to this letter in a second, um, Louise Pound, the object of Cather's intense college crush. With a letter in Cather's own words published for all to read, Akachella claims the case for Cather's lesbianism evaporates. The fact that Cather shared homes and her life with Edith Lewis from 1908 through 1947 is evidence of nothing, it would seem. And for Akachella, Cather's glorious love letter to Edith Lewis, which is right here, written in 1936, 28 years after they first moved in together, and which also appeared in the selected letters and now has been published in the complete letters, which is a freely available digital edition, and from which I derived the title of my book has no significance. If Cather had lived for nearly, nearly 40 years with a man, would anyone be caviling about evidence? In Will Cather and the Politics of Criticism, Akachella describes Cather as living not as a woman was expected to live in her time as a wife and mother, but operating freely and doing her work. Akachella further characterizes Cather's choice as contributing hugely to the cause of women. She also accuses academic feminists, however, of resenting Cather's choice. She broke out of jail and now they are putting her and all of women writers back in. And characterizing Cather's as options as marriage and motherhood or freedom through work, Akachella elides an important historical fact. Cather couldn't marry Edith Lewis or any other woman during all of the years of her life. Cather was, arguably more socially and culturally conservative than some of her more avant-garde lesbian peers, say, Juna Barnes or Janet Flanner. And I doubt that had she been inclined to live with a man, she would have done so for four decades without marrying him. Catherine Lewis, however, could not have gone to church, a church, or to a city hall to claim public recognition for the life they lived together. Cather's conservatism has, I believe, been overplayed, overstated, particularly by influential biographer James Woodruff. Indeed, for Woodruff, whose biography appeared shortly after O'Brien's, his insistence on Cather's conservatism was a key element of his denial of her lesbianism. That Cather could have been both conservative and lesbian, and that her relationship with Lewis might have been acknowledged and values by, not valued by friends and family, no longer seems so strange. One of the oddest features of Akachella's argument in both her book and her more recent blog post is her citing of Lillian Federman's surpassing the love of men in support of her claim that Cather's romantic crushes on women were not evidence of lesbianism because, quote, women in the 19th century, the century in which Cather grew up, had far more effusive, more physical friendships than they have today. 
In actuality, however, Faderman identifies Cather as a modern lesbian, distinguishing her from the 19th century Boston marriage tradition exemplified by Sarah Orne Jewett in Annie Adams Fields. Now to turn to a little different away from the book, a book that I did not read until after I finished my own book, Between Women, Friendship, Desire and Marriage in Victorian England by Sharon Marcus, has given me some new ways to think about Catherine Lewis and questions of evidence. And so this is about England and the United States. There are some key differences, but I still found this just really useful for thinking about what, uh, what, how these questions have been sort of deformed. Um, in Marcus's discussion of what she identifies as a socially recognized institution of the female marriage in Victorian England, Marcus draws a distinction between subcultures and networks. Looking at lesbian life from the perspective of the mid 20th century, we're accustomed to looking for lesbian subcultures, think the lesbian bar, the lesbian softball team. However, Marcus argues that couples and female marriages were part of social networks that, while they included other female couples, also included straight married couples. Put another way, these couples were not part of a lesbian subculture. One of the reasons that I think Cather and Lewis as a couple have seemed invisible as such, or have seemed to have been closeted, is that there was an emerging les sub lesbian subculture in Greenwich Village, where they lived until 1927. And they were not, as far as I have been able to determine, a part of it. I now turn to how Marcus's distinction between subculture and network can reframe how Cather and Lewis functioned as a couple in two settings away from New York City, Grand Manan Island and Jaffrey, New Hampshire. The Whale Cove community of which Cather and Lewis became a part beginning in 1922 is where I see them functioning as part of a women only subculture. The Whale Cove group was founded in the early 20th century by three women who graduated from the Boston Normal School of Gymnastics, a training school for gym teachers. Through at least 1940, as far as I can tell, only women owned or rented at Whale Cove. Whale Cove was not an exclusively lesbian community, however. It was more of what I have come to think of as lesbian-ish. In addition to romantic couples, there were pairs of sisters, widowed mothers with their daughters and nieces as guests, including Cather's nieces. As the women who owned property there died off and because they did not have children to inherit their cottages, the lesbian-ish history of the community was lost and denied by nieces and nephews who inherited it and turned it into a family resort. In Jaffrey, New Hampshire, Cather and Lewis stayed at the Shattuck Inn, where they were, to use Marcus's terminology, part of a network rather than a subculture. Lewis spent less time here than did Cather. After all, she had a salaried office job in Manhattan, but she still spent more time here with Cather than has been recognized. This picture, for example, the only proper picture of the two women together that I have found, was taken in Jaffrey in 1926 by a woman who was apparently part of their social circle, their network at the Shattuck Inn. The photographer is identified in the source where I found the photograph only as Mrs. Josiah Wheelwright. Of course, she's reduced to the wife of a man. I'm pretty sure, however, that she was Lois Curtis Nelson Wheelwright. Born and raised in Chicago, she graduated from Radcliffe College in 1921 and in October, 1926, had just married Josiah Wheelwright of Beacon Street in Boston. I mean, she probably was on her honeymoon when she took this picture. Cather and Lewis are on the town common and the old meeting house is visible behind them to the left. So you can see the steeple of the church building slightly. Earlier that summer, they had spent a month in the Southwest, first conducting research for Cather's novel, Death Comes to the Archbishop, and then spending a week with Willa's brother Roscoe and his family, wife Meta and three daughters. After Lewis boarded a train to return to Manhattan, Cather had planned to spend time writing at Mabel Lujan's compound in Taos, uh, where Cather and Lewis had spent two weeks together the year before. However, it ended up not suiting her and New York City was too hot to write. So in August, with no room available at the Shattuck Inn, Cather asked to be accommodated at the McDowell Colony, not far from Jaffrey in Peterborough. While she was at the McDowell Colony, Edith Lewis went on her own to Grand Manan to purchase the land at Whale Cove and make arrangements for construction of their own cottage, which was ready for them by the summer of 1928. Lewis's smile 
says to me that she was feeling pretty pleased with that purchase. I also suspect that she was sad about the recent death of her father, who was buried in the family's pot plot in a country uh, graveyard in East Claremont, New Hampshire. I would hazard a guess that she made a point of visiting his grave while she was in Jaffrey. Henry Lewis had died in California in the middle of her New Mexico time with Cather and Cather's family. In any event, there they are, a couple, enjoying an autumn day in public. A newly married young straight woman took a snapshot of them together. They would return to the Shattuck Inn together a number of times in future years. From the Shattuck Inn in 1936, I'll say again, Cather would write to Lewis the beautiful surviving, one surviving uh, letter, full dress letter. There are also postcards from which I took the title of my book. Lewis would care for Cather in their Park Avenue apartment through two medically difficult years at the end of Cather's life. Lewis would choose the old burying ground just out of range in this picture behind the meeting house as Cather's final resting place. And she would design this beautiful headstone as a semi-public memorial to her dead partner. Cather left most of her assets, including books and papers to Lewis and made her her literary executor in which capacity Lewis commissioned a biography and wrote her own memoir of Cather. To return to Sharon Marcus's observation about female marriage and to questions of evidence, Marcus points to many practices that marked women as married to each other in Victorian Britain, such as co-residence, you know, Cather and Lewis lived together for nearly 40 years, the care of the body and life and death. Yes, Edith Lewis cared for Willa Cather during her final years and her struggle with cancer. The intermingling of assets, Yes, and the use of wills to convey property, including papers, after death, exactly what Cather did in relation to Lewis. While some would insist that we cannot know whether such relationships between women were sexual, Marcus argues that a search for explicit written evidence about sex is wrongheaded because it was precisely discretion about sexual matters that marked marriage, both in the case of female couples and legally married opposite sex couples. So from my perspective, 38 and a half years living together openly is more than enough evidence that Cather and Lewis were a lesbian couple. So there we go. I'll open it up for questions. You're muted. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. So if anyone in the audience would like to post a question, uh, certainly do that now. Um, but meanwhile, um, I'm wondering if there is anything that you wish uh, you could have included in your book, um, perhaps some of the new reading you've done or perhaps another story that had to get cut for space reasons. Um, um, I mean, there were some things that I had that I somehow didn't manage to include and I wish I had. Like one of the few letters by Edith Lewis to anyone, it was to Oxa Barlow Brewster, her college roommate. Um, one of the few letters I have that Edith Lewis wrote a person, one of the few personal letters I have that Edith Lewis wrote while with a cather was alive. I had it, I had it for a long time and I forgot to, <laughs> uh -huh. or maybe actually maybe that one was misfiled somewhere at Drew. Maybe I actually didn't know that one. That would have been really good because it's, it's, it's a great letter from 1923. Um, I say in my book that I thought I didn't um, know how she precisely how she spent her college graduation weekend. One of her college textbooks is at the Harry Ransom Center in a collection called Willa Cather's Library, which of course is Willa Cather and Edith Lewis's library. And she actually wrote out what she did for college. And I had that and I totally forgot it. So I knew exactly yeah. that there is like, you know, who she went to the Shakespeare play with, who she marched in with Ivy Day. It was there. And I just said, uh -huh. and then I also found out she was a bridesmaid for a college classmate between her junior and senior year. And the classmate, her father was an officer of the Century Publishing Company, which is how she got a job at the Century Publishing Company, uh -huh. obviously. And he's mentioned uh -huh. as an officer of the corporation that I knew and will look living. So those are a few little things. So, yeah. yes. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Okay. We have a couple uh, uh, comments here. Um, uh, Etta says, thanks for such a concise and insightful overview to a rich relationship. And then we have a, a comment and question from Chris. Congratulations on the book. I look forward to reading it. I was wondering if you could comment on the partnership 
between Father Jean and Father Joseph in death as uh, death comes for the Archbishop as an analog of the partnership between Willa Cather and Edith Lewis. Um, yes, that is something that I actually do make um, an argument for, not in a really precise way. Um, I, I think that their relationship in many ways doesn't um, quite track because one of the things that happens in that book is that their partnership, they spend a lot of time apart because, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Wait a second. So it's the father. So um, Latour and what's he called in the book? I forget. Anyway, Vaillant, Vaillant. So Vaillant is sent away. He's actually not there with Latour most of the time, right? So that relationship is central to the book, but it's actually about them being separated uh, quite a bit of the time that they're there. So I think Catherine Lewis spent more time together, but certainly they were, um, when they went to Mesa Verde, which becomes the basis for the professor's house, they were playing cowboy uh, as part of my argument. But when they discovered the story, uh, this, you know, started to think about the novel Death Comes to the Archbishop, they were kind of playing frontier priests is my sense of it. So their pleasure they had in riding through the desert and finding out about these priests is kind of translated into the pleasure of that relationship in the novel. Um, so it is, uh, you know, for the most part, I don't really try to read Cather's fiction um, through the relationship. And I certainly don't look at the fiction as evidence for the relationship, but the Southwestern fiction is a place where you can just see um, their pleasure in travel and shared experience being transferred and complicated in indirect ways onto the page. So, yes. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. It's uh, really interesting to me that still so many people seem resistant to recognizing a decades long relationship as a, a real relationship. So, um, so Chris, thanks you for that. Um, I was also thinking about all of the work that you clearly have done in archives um, and wonder if you would want to talk a little bit about how that kind of hands-on research then gets translated into a final draft of a, a book that is, 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 you know, not thousands of pages long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is that uh, I, I think that it, most books like this would be based on a rich archive of letters. There is not one for them. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of every time I seem to hit a brick wall and couldn't get information, I would just be like, can I go around the back door, open up and look in here? So the, a lot of the archival material is not um, like you have hundreds of letters and how do you decide what to quote? A lot of it has to do with pulling bits of information from various places and weaving them together when you have enough information to do it. So there is a lot of information that it was just like, well, there, I don't have enough to tell the story. So it's just off the page. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, chronology is how I write. And so every chapter, there was at least a 50 page single space chronology behind it, which <laughs> just put all the information together until I could see the connections. But a lot of what's in the chronology, I would never put in the book unless I were just going to write a chronicle and you don't want to chronicle, you want stories. Um, and the final thing I would say is that a lot of the information and the stories came in to my research very late in the last few years as materials came in. And in particular, through odd trails, more letters from her college roommate and her college roommate's husband and then widower to Edith Lewis. Don't have the other side of the correspondence, but got more and more and that was really where I found most. In fact, sometimes it's like you say in your letter, don't have her letter, uh -huh. but she's quoted back. Yeah. And that was where I really started to find um, a lot of the most emotionally rich material about Edith Lewis was in reading letters to her from her college roommate. And uh -huh. those came in quite late, right? So they just kept yeah. sort of, you know, pouring in as it were. Yeah. Well, you spent a long time writing this book, right? 18 years. <laughs> yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah i know it's like my book was going off to college it could vote couldn't yeah. drink yet uh -huh. i could do all the drinking yeah. when i was done yeah yeah 
Yeah, well, I think a lot of people outside the academy don't always realize how um, how many how many projects many of us have going on at the same time. Right? I was doing um, other things. It's true, I was doing other things, but I mean, I would also imagine that um, you know I've started like listening to and hanging out at least virtually because conference hasn't been on like people who write trade biography. I think people who write trade biography would have never done what I did. Well, you know, because it would have yeah. just taken like, you know, it would be like, where can I find the materials to write narrative nonfiction? And it would be like, well, let's not try that one because, right, you know, it just had to be really, really motivated and persistent and, um, and yeah, and maybe a little crazy. So, yes, yes. Well, I know you re you're very persistent in trying to track down the yes. most obscure details. Yes. So here is a question from Desiree. Um, Congratulations on the towering accomplishment of this book. Can you elaborate more on whether or not we can, should understand Cather's fiction as lesbian fiction or existing within a tradition of lesbian literature? So Desiree, that's a great question. And I would say at some point, um, I mean, in my work as a whole, I'm not big on questions like that. I'm more interested in recovering sort of the histories of production and consumption in a different sense. Um, but I would say, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. And I think also, I guess the thing that I started to really think when I started talking to people about the book once it was published is that um, a, a lot of scholarship is really reading fiction as, um, kind of as, as always as autobiographical and you're looking for perhaps repressed or suppressed traces of the life. And, um, and so you keep saying things like, well, why is Cather always writing books where men are at the center of them or something? And at some point I just started to think, well, why can't she just have the artistic liberty to write about what she wants to? So I would say, um, you know, Cather was a lesbian and she wrote books, but that kind of necessary connection between personal and subjective experience in that way and literature, I, I think it's even perhaps maybe even more important to allow women that liberty and not to think that always has to be the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's always an interesting question when you're creating a syllabus that has any kind of narrow or focus than something like American literature. So if you're talking about African-American literature or other ethnic literature or women's literature or something, is authorship the only criteria or are there other criteria? Well, yeah. there's the old model of images of women in literature, yes. Yes. But, but would you put the professor's house in a women's lit course or death comes for the archbishop? I mean, Cather, there's even letters where she's like, well, that's a book where the only woman was the Virgin Mary. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. she recognizes that. She recognizes yeah. that as well, so yes. <laughs> We have another question uh, from Krista. Um, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Is there much evidence of Cather's response to Lewis's editing? I'm thinking about the complexity of a partnership that includes a working relationship and editing, no less. How did these women engage over the work parts of their lives? Well, um, the most complete editorial archive is for the stories in Obscure Destinies, which if people have not read the stories in there, Old Mrs. Harris and Neighbor Roski, I think are two of the most beautiful short stories ever written and they are not enough read by people and you should go read them. I will say that. But um, there are two or even three edited typescripts for each of those stories. And so you can see sometimes um, there's a real handing back and forth. So I showed the, the two friends typescript where it's all Edith Lewis's handwriting, in part because Willa Cather went into a crisis, her mother had just died. And I actually got this very finely in chronology here. And I think Edith Lewis basically took over the responsibility because Cather couldn't go to her mother's funeral. It was too difficult to get from this island off the coast of Canada. And, and Edith Lewis really just finished um, but you can see on these other versions, they go back and forth, but they go back and forth in both directions. So they were handing them back and forth. And sometimes Edith Lewis went first and Edith and Willa Cather would cross it out and put like, and then Edith Lewis would go and cancel Cather's revision and revert to what she had said, right? So I think that there is definitely a, a back and forth. 
and um, I, I talk about it as what I call productive friction. Right? Uh-huh. That, 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 that sort of, you know, that, that contact, the moving back and forth polishes it and makes it into that sort of, um, you know, the style that everybody thinks of as Cather involves the two negotiating over language and then you end up with the beautiful end result. Um, there's less evidence of Willa Cather responding to Edith Lewis's advertising, but there is some. Uh, it's clear. In fact, there's one letter where she sends to her brother, Roscoe's wife, Meta. She sends what I, it took me a while to figure this out. It's actually a proof of an advertisement for Fanny Farmer candies. It's a World War II advertisement. Um, and she's like, this is one of the best ads Edith has ever done. Um, and it was actually, she sent it well before the advertisement was published. So Edith Lewis had brought home proof copy of advertisements and and she sends it. Um, And then there's also this uh, depression era advertising um, booklet for Traveler's Aid, which dealt a lot with unhoused people essentially during the, who are moving around, right? Itinerant people in the Great Depression. And um, at the J. Walter Thompson Company, Helen Lansdowne Reeser, who was, um, the wife of Stanley Reeser, who was the CEO of the company, who was also involved, although in a way that they pretended she really, was. anyway, long story, but Helen Reeser was involved with the Traveler's Aid, and she was kind of making work for people, and there is this, this brochure where Edward Steichen is taking these pictures of these, like, older women who were getting benefit from Traveler's Aid during the Great Depression, and Edith Lewis had written the copy, and she sends it to a friend back in Red Cloud, like, I thought, you know, and friend in Red Cloud thinks that she's being asked for money to contribute to Traveler's Aid. And she's like, oh, no, no, no. I just thought the pictures, the pictures of the old ladies are lovely. And Edith, you know, Edith wrote all the copy and the stories are lovely. You know? so, so you do see, you know, I mean, I think I think if you assume that Willa Cather would not care about Edith Lewis's advertising career, that would be, you know, like, come on, of course they had to talk about it. Sure. Um, but she also gets a little like, you know, she gets a little snarky and the snark goes in the other direction. There's this one moment when um, Edith Lewis actually wrote the jacket copy for one of ours. uh, And there's something about, you know, you know, Miss Lewis says it was very hard to write advertising copy when she wasn't allowed to say what the novel was about. She didn't want World War I in the jacket copy. Um, And then there's another instant where um, Cather actually wrote a blurb for a book. Joseph Castle, it's like a war related book. She wrote a blurb and, um, and, and she's like, well, she rarely did that, right? But she said, Miss Lewis scoffs at me. <laughs> <laughs> because she said, you know, because, you know, it's for me, it's not professional writing advertising. Yes. It's just what I feel, you know? So you can imagine them actually having these conversations about where Edith Lewis is like, oh, you don't know how to write advertising, yeah. honey. You just know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay, Travis says, thanks for this amazing talk and book, Melissa. I'm wondering if this project has changed the way you teach Cather's fiction or introduce her to students. Hi, Travis. Um, well, you know, I, I, I haven't taught, well, I have taught, I mean, I've taught some short stories that are in, you know, like a survey anthology. There was um, Neighbor Rosicky recently. Um, but in that context, I didn't really have enough time. I mean, I've certainly, when I, I've taught graduate seminars on Cather, yes, this work has very much, you know, informed and, and you know, the grad students in the department certainly know that I was working on this book and then published this book. Um, um, but, hmm, you know, that's a really good question, Travis, but I would have to say, I am not sure in what concrete way that it has. I think I've been working on it for so long that, it's informed my approach for such a long time. Maybe it's not a recent change. Um, I certainly have a complicated sense of Willa Cather in literary history because as Travis knows, I work mostly on 19th century American women. Um, and you know, Cather has such status as the superior artist and whatnot. Um, and that, um, that is not my favorite thing about her. I don't like her literary politics much. Uh, and that's always an interesting challenge for me. So, but I also yeah. love the fiction and I, I will tell students, you know, that neighbor Rosicky and old Mrs. Harris make me cry. I'm not afraid to admit those sorts of things. And it is, it is important to me that Edith Lewis was involved in editing old Mrs. Harris, because I think, yes, like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. When I figured out that she had done that, that was important to me personally. <laughs> uh, 
Because yeah. it's my favorite Keller story. So yes, well, it is always complicated when you love the work but are conflicted about the author. But which authors could we ever not be conflicted about? So, yeah. 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 So I have there's another question here from Etta that you touched on earlier, but she says. I'm curious about what you didn't include because of space, but if you had more room would have included, especially material you found in the archive that others had not discussed. Um, well, I mean, no, I mean, um, nobody had discussed Edith Lewis, but me pretty much. So that's pretty easy to, um, and what else would I have? Oh, well, there was there was so much more. There was a much longer version of chapter one, all the 19th century stuff. I wanted all the 19th century stuff in there. Uh, her family history. I had to cut back so much of the family history, uh, which was, yeah. um, I mean, I did manage to get a few things in there. Like, oh, oh, she had a great aunt who was one of the trans poets who channeled dead Edgar Allan Poe in the 19th century. <laughs> That is not in there. I had to take that out for space constraints. I did get her other great or great, great aunt who was, you know, when Margaret Fuller went to Europe and she was taking care of uh, um, the, you know, the children of, of friends, right? Like she was acting as a nanny essentially. Edith Lewis's family tree, that's right. You know, so that's there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I got Emerson's granddaughter in there. I got, but there was so much more 19th century family history that I wanted to, you know, that I wanted to to get in there, and I had to cut a lot of that back. Yeah. That's probably the yeah. You know. It's always so heartbreaking. Yeah, I know, but it's also me being a 19th century Americanist and just um, loving all of that 19th century detail and all of that New England yeah. New England history that right from the start, I kind of recognized even the first time that what I realized uh, Edith Lewis's middle name was Labrie. I was like, that just kind of feels like one of those New England corrupted French names, the way that, you know, names like, they don't, because when I went to college in Massachusetts, right, it is, it was Huguenots, right? It wasn't Canucks, yeah. it wasn't the French Canadians, it was Huguenots, but that's exactly what it was. And that was, you know, on her father's side of the family, there's the Huguenot heritage. There was more about the Huguenots in the book to see, there you go. It was all the early American, uh, 19th yeah. century Americans uh -huh. that I did cut out of chapter one. Um, yeah, yeah. Good. I think there might've even been more Smith College I had to cut out. That was, how, yeah, I had to I had to trim that yeah. down too. Chapter one, that's where all the stuff that I, I would have liked that chapter to be 50% longer, but I would have lost most of my audience before they got to chapter two, so. Yeah. Okay, yeah, interesting. So. Um... What are you working on next? I'm working on a critical edition of uh, Ministry's Wing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. I really want to write a dual biography of Annie Fields and Sarah Orange Jewett, but I don't think I can do both of those things at the same time, unfortunately. <laughs> so, But the yeah. prequel, I did want the prequel of the Jewett and Fields relationship, which would begin and end. Actually, Willa Cather would be at the beginning and she'd be towards the end. So I could imagine, you know, I think it would be possible to find out exactly when Willa Cather first went to 148 Charles Street and met Sarah Orange Jewett and Annie Fields. I think that's possible. If you spent like a month in Boston, just hunting through all of the archives, all of the, like the Brandeis family, the, like I'm sure it's in there somewhere. And I could just imagine her, you know, being on the, you know, the front steps waiting for, um, you know, Mrs. Brandeis to knock on the door for her to go in. I bet I could figure out who was in the room there for tea. I could, but I could just imagine like, you know, the sort of, you know, what would Willa Cather be thinking as she's waiting for this long anticipated opportunity to meet Fields and Jewett. She, you know, S.S. Yeah. McClure was supposed to bring her up the, supposed to come up the year before and take her to 148 Charles Street and he didn't fulfill his promise. And now Mrs. <laughs> Brandeis is taking her. And then at the end, after, um, after Sarah Orange Jewett dies, um, uh, Cather goes up to uh, Boston and visits and, and um, uh, helps uh, Annie Fields with sorting through papers. And um, I'm pretty sure she helped recover um, uh, William's wedding, um, the Jewett story um, that's sort of like, you know, outside of country, the point of furs. I feel pretty sure that she was responsible for helping to find that and getting it um, published in the Atlantic Monthly. So I could just imagine Jewett, I mean, so Willa Cather coming back mm -hmm. and handling all of that too, so. 
Okay, uh, Lucy says, I love this presentation. Looking forward to reading the book, congratulations. So thank you. Uh, that uh, is all of our questions. It's been a really rich conversation, really fun for me. Um, anything, any last words you wanna leave us with? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say if anybody has a, a real hope for writing something that will be accessible and cross over to trade, you need to find a trade publisher. You need to get an agent. Um, because Oxford University Press entirely failed to get any attention for my book. Um, and that has been the great sadness. So, I mean, if, if you, you know, I've been giving all of these talks because of that, but if you really aspire to get attention from non-academic audiences, I didn't realize that's what I was doing until after I signed the contract with Oxford, which was supposed to cross over to trade. They, you know, it's priced, it's only $40 for a long book, all of these things, but, um, but then it's just, um, yeah, yeah. So I think if you have that aspiration, anybody out there, get an okay. agent, get yourself to a trade press, that would be my, my last, my final word of advice. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. And I'll look forward to when we meet again in person and yeah. um, everybody seems to be looking forward to reading the book. All right. Bye, All right. everybody. Bye.